Welcome everyone, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, amazing webinar which is in front of us uh, and with the title, very promising one, I have to admit, Integrated Customer Journeys at Scale. There's a lot of talk about customer journeys and how to align them in the proper way. And uh, even better, what we expect today is that we speak about a real case study, a use case coming from Leo Pharma together with Shower Thinking. And really pleased to welcome here today uh, Peter Rahn from uh, Leo Pharma. Hi, Peter. How are you? Great to be here, Dario. Thank you. And Joaquin Pais, uh, the CEO of uh, Shower Thinking. Very same question to you, Joaquin. How are you doing? Fine. Thank you. Uh, Dario, honored to be here. Fantastic. So, gentlemen, before we deep dive into our discussion, uh, Joaquin and his team together, of course, with Leo Pharma prepared a very nice video. So I will use three to four minutes to play that video so that the audience can uh, see that video and uh, somehow that we kick off the discussion into the proactive way. So let's start and showcase the video. To have a real conversation between brand and HCP, you need connected data. A customer-centric strategy is the only approach to deliver personalized experiences. When it comes to the pharmaceutical industry, being able to manage activity across both face-to-face -face and digital channels is crucial. Now more than ever, healthcare professionals are looking for messages tailored to their situation and needs. Over the last few years, Leo Pharma has been looking to technology and using data to understand audiences and design interactions. HCPs demand quality content relevant for the individual. The recent pandemic has only accelerated an evolution of digital and multi-channel activities at an unprecedented rate. This new digital world of customer engagement represents a big opportunity. The opportunity to add value across strategic interaction points and orchestrate key messages across channel preferences to achieve more impact. Leo Pharma has implemented a global engagement infrastructure where Viva, Marketing Automation with Salesforce Marketing Cloud, and Sitecore Web Platforms are connected. With activities in Europe, the United States, and many other countries, they are now focusing on the creation of global content which can be repurposed for multiple channels, such as email, web, and face-to-face -face or other meetings. The company had 3.6 million interactions with HCPs in Europe in 2021 in what was a remarkable increase when compared to pre-pandemic levels. Leo Pharma is also using its growing ability to track across channels in order to understand healthcare professionals. This new omni-channel analytics strategy is being designed to help and guide commercial activities new ways of working, tech skills, and a different engagement mindset are needed for this new model. Leo Pharma has engaged with trusted external partners like Shower Thinking to accelerate digital transformation and omni-channel implementation processes. Integrated cross-channel customer journeys are to be implemented at scale, and the focus is to create value little by little and to consolidate the omni-channel model change has already started. Let's talk with Peter Raun, one of the key Leo Pharma team members driving this change, to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities being found in this process. Excellent, I suppose, and I'm pretty much confident that the audience really enjoyed in that amazing video. But uh, let's deep dive into our concrete conversation and we, pre we prepared some very tough questions for Peter because we are, of course, very, very curious what you have achieved and uh, how you achieved that. So my first question to you, Peter, would be uh, what are the key drivers behind the Leo Pharma only channel transformation process? Uh, thanks again for inviting me, Dario, and, and thanks for a really good question. Uh, I think uh, a key driver, uh, which is also very dear to my heart, is uh, say the needs of the customers or the uh, how customers uh, like to engage with pharma. And, and this is really the main driver also long before COVID, um, that customers just like uh, you and me 
uh, wants to engage digitally. Uh, they want to engage in, in the channel of their choice. Uh, and and that's uh, why we should engage uh, through Omni Channel with the customers. Um, of course, also access, maybe due to customers becoming more and more digital, um, and also for other reasons, is becoming more and more restricted uh, between doctors and pharma, especially in some countries where it's getting really hard. Uh, and finally, uh, pharma, even though pharma is a, uh, a high-profit industry, uh, also efficiency is really needed. Um, we cannot afford to send reps to, to say, for any purpose uh, in the future. Uh, it has to be where the, uh, the value is. And when there is value, then it's really uh, the most impactful way to engage. Uh, but other channels need to be part of the mix as well. Thank you, Peter. Next um, question. Sorry, yeah, you. What, <clears throat> allow me also, yes, thank you. Allow me to uh, highlight some, some points here. Uh, we, uh, when we start to work with the uh, Leo Pharma, it was already four years ago. So uh, from my point of view, I think that uh, Leo Pharma has been a visionary in this sector for this uh, whole strategy, multi-channel strategy and new way of uh, interacting with customers. So uh, I think it's important and will come through the conversation because I think that we have here a lot of experience, probably in many pharma companies, as you commented me before this, this meeting, uh, are going very fast in this kind of new models without enough uh, experience. And um, I think here that the, the team of Peter have a lot of experience for many years in getting this milestone and the results that uh, you are having with this interaction with the customers. Thank you, Joaquin. Next question, Peter. Um, I don't know if you noticed that, but uh, many pharma companies actually struggle uh, by going from traditional to digital, right? <laughs> so uh, how have you obtained support uh, from the management and, of course, from Leo in particular to go into that uh, whole transformation process? Um, first of all, I would say it is not so that Leo isn't struggling as well. Uh, Leo is also has also been in pharma for more than 100 years, uh, and, and we have pharma has always been a. I don't know if it always has, but it has in many years been a profitable industry. Uh, and of course, when you're a profitable industry, you don't change uh, too much. Um, uh, and I would also say from from pharma, where the traditional sales and marketing is really ingrained in our culture. Uh, Omnichannel is a huge step forward, um, and, and I think it makes sense to maybe compare uh, Omnichannel uh, to an elephant. Uh, we all know that an elephant is a huge animal, um, and in order to eat an elephant, I think some of us also know that we have to eat it bite by bite, uh, and it's the same for Omnichannel. Omnichannel is a huge transformation, and if we try to do everything, the whole transformation at once, uh, I'm very doubtful that we'll be able to do it. Uh, so it's really for me uh, trying to make the, the transformation step by step, finding good, uh, say, good examples, uh, good uh, elements of our sales and marketing activities uh, where we can uh, exemplify Omnichannel, uh, where we can show that uh, uh, some of the key elements of Omnichannel uh, makes a difference, uh, and then also where we can teach the organization um what omnichannel is uh, and then uh, so i think that that has been important in, in getting the support um or not so much getting the support because omnichannel is really part of our long-term strategy in, in leo and has been for some time so we 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 know that we need to change our engagement model so it hasn't been so much about getting senior management support it's been more about getting the understanding and the skills in the organization Thank you, Peter. Joaquin, anything to add? Maybe do you see still the struggle or does that change with... Uh, with, uh, with no, uh, my, my feeling here is that in this project with uh, Peter, what I feel is that uh, what is working really well is the bottom-up approach. So it's not uh, much of a management decision, but uh, I think that uh, uh, the team of Peter have engaged very well with the local affiliates, the local markets, and they are really convinced that they need to change and they need to advance, advance in this kind of project. A concept that we use very often is the concept of traction. So are the, the local markets, local marketing teams really asking for more or you need to continually um, uh, educate them and push them to 
uh, this kind of uh, strategy. So I think that the, uh, what the P Dino Peter have achieved here is a really a nice traction for the local affiliates, and they have a, a complete uh, buy, you know, for the local affiliates. And I think it's part of the success that we see here in this kind of adoption. Thank you, Joaquin. Next question, Peter. Uh, what are some of the critical omni-channel transformation challenges and activities that are going on at Leo? Uh, let me highlight uh, three uh, key activities. Um, one, which I think is, is maybe the most important, is integration of sales and marketing. Uh, from my perspective, we cannot do omni-channel if it's led by either marketing or led by either sales. Uh, we have to have sales and marketing, uh, say, participating in the customer journeys. Um, and we have to have value for sales and marketing coming out of the customer journeys. Uh, an example of value for, for sales could be that a customer journey uh, delivers a, a hot lead, something to call on for the rep. Uh, a value for marketing could be an insight about the physician so that we can improve the way we engage uh, with that physician next time. So integration of sales and marketing is, is one uh, key element. Another one is uh, to move from quantity to quality uh, and use data uh, to, to move towards quality. Quality of engagement, uh, select the audience of the campaign better than we did in the past. Not do it for everyone, but do it for those whom we believe is relevant for and who we believe will respond. Uh, and then finally, um, I would say always set objectives for, for what we do. Set uh, campaign objectives, customer journey objectives, uh, objectives which helps us evaluate if, if we've been successful or not. Um, and I would say in many cases, we are not as successful as we would like, uh, but it gives us incredibly good learnings. Uh, so even though that we may not get as many hot leads or as many uh, click-throughs uh, to, uh, to a video or whatever we, we plan for, uh we learn why we didn't get it uh and we can improve next time so that we can say offer something to click on uh, or to engage around uh which is becoming more and more valuable for the physician because i think this is really uh the direction we are going uh, finding say, more and more value for the physicians in the engagement and we cannot do it without the insights Absolutely. thank you so so carefully plan your journey for the customer journey right? <laughs> exactly yeah exactly no it takes time yeah Thank you, Peter. Well, what? Think, right? <laughs> no, one, one of the, we have a, a meeting in, in Barcelona this year, first time face-to-face, uh, -face, and one of the point, points I like it most is that everyone needed to present, I mean, the local affiliates, which is the, the customer's journey, the worst customer's journey that you made in the year, and which are, you know, the, the learnings, and was really nice, you know, to for everyone to expose saying okay we haven't achieved and this i think that these are the reasons and the conversation after uh, this presentation was really uh, incredible and for me uh, a key point you know on achieving the the next way of uh, results that we see here also um for everyone it was um, explained a little bit on the video but uh, i think that the the way of structuring the campaigns some of them are for more awareness and getting a major audience but here at the Leo they are structured also for uh, getting this uh, better knowledge and best interaction together with the field force and this is one of the factors I think that are working really nice here. There you go. Thank you Joaquin. Let's remain with you and I have a very intriguing question which uh, I, I talked about some, some day ago when I prepared for the webinar which is uh, what are the emerging profiles needed to understand a more tech enabled world? Uh -huh. Wow this is a, uh, a big question. Uh, I think my, my, my feeling you know in, in moving I also when I moved back also here to Europe I thought that uh, I see that the same a situation that uh, exists in the United States with a major shortage in Canada or with a major shortage of, of um, human resources and specific in the in this industry will happen also in, in Europe. It's a matter of probably months here. So this is something that uh, we need to seriously consider. Also the the consultancies and also the, the, the customers, everyone in the in the industry. And uh, from my point of view, we see a major shift or major change 
in, in the profiles, at least what we are asking at the, what we see uh, that everyone is asking in the in industry. Before it was a more agnostic technology, having a, a better knowledge. And my, my feeling is that uh, different customers and companies and agencies are asking more and more for a specific technology knowledge uh, behind. Obviously, we are a Salesforce partner and, and we are very, um, very hard on tr and trying to improve in this, uh, in this area. But I see that generally speaking, uh, b knowing the technology is not um, um, uh, anymore um, uh, um, enough. So you need to really uh, have a deep knowledge on a specific technology, could be a different one from Salesforce, whatever you choose but really be knowledgeable in this uh, technology more and more. Thank you, Martin. Next question for you, Peter, which is uh, how are you working to ensure adoption of the new omni-channel model across the organization? That's a pretty much tough one. And I, I'm sure that the audience really is wondering that segment. No, you're right. It's, um, it's a difficult one, but, and it's also a very relevant one, uh, Dario. It's, uh, um, and again, we, we, we sort of tend to, to think that uh, we all should embrace or buy into omnichannel um, when working in sales and marketing or pharma now because we know that we have to because our customers expect it uh, and our management expect it. But at the same time, uh, I'm not really sure that we should we should aim to get everybody to uh, embrace and, and uh, adopt to omnichannel. Uh, many of our colleagues come from, um, you say, uh, has been working with pharma for for many years. Uh, have maybe become a pharma rep because they like to uh, achieve the personal engagement with the physician. Uh, they like the independence. Uh, uh, they like the relationship, uh, and and they find it difficult to you say to do that through an email. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think we we should of course work to get people on board to find their roles to see the benefit because i honestly think that omnichannel has benefits for all of us uh, in the way we, we can get, get better in working with the physicians uh, and promoting our brands um, but again i think we, we should do it step by steps uh, we should rather get some good learning some good upskilling from uh, smaller projects uh, with some people in the beginning and then when we can start getting uh, key people on board, seeing the benefits from the sales side or marketing side, medical side, regulatory side, then I'm convinced that the rest of the organization will also start seeing the benefits. Um, and then having people, as we, for example, use uh, shower thinking, uh, working with us uh, to, to say, help support uh, with the affiliates about how do we, how do, we do things uh, in the right way if we don't have the skills uh, locally. Um, so, so that's also, there's many elements of this, uh, say, journey of uh, transformation. Mm, certainly. Maybe just to add, uh, partnering is, I would say, something where pharma is not used to, right? But uh, it's very good that uh, at least you are very mm -hmm. open and you know the necessity of, of partnering with appropriate and competitive companies, right? That well, is clear. Just, just, so just one additional comment, uh, Daria, because I, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, partnering is, is very important uh, because we are, we are not a say a technical we are we are a very technical uh, organization when it comes to uh, developing uh, new drugs uh, and, and getting them through the approval processes and so on but when it comes to using technology in sales and marketing uh, that's not really our stronghold and i think it's really important that we we find partners who can supplement us where we have our weak points uh, and that is for example about some of the technical solutions which are becoming more and more technical uh, for us so having reliable partners is, is very important for us thank you peter Joaquin, anything to add here uh yeah and something that uh, we discuss in one of our calls dario i am um, my point is is the next i see that the industry is in this moment is uh, considering okay this is okay this kind of technologies the whole marketing automation the whole my the channel I've sent so many mail and I still haven't uh, sell anything more you know this is the the overall reaction in the in the industry I need that needs to be considered more carefully this kind of uh, approach and what I basically mean that when we see some customers we um, check that 
the kind of interactions that they uh, have set up with the customer are very basic. They, they haven't evolved, you know, in different kinds of uh, really multi-channel approach kind of things, and they just stay in a basic uh, digital communication using the, the email as uh, it was uh, before the, the, the pandemic. I also hear a lot now in, in the pharma sector uh, that uh, there, there is too much email. Uh, my, my suggestion is that we have already a lot of email on uh, 2018, on 2019, before the, the, the pandemic. So here, the key point is to, to consider to do implement which are the best practice in the industry and as Peter commented to really integrate the sales channel with these digital strategies and evolve from from this point so it was a little bit of criticism uh, about the industry and this um, kind of very quick uh, results that uh, you are having during the, the the pandemic and have a more overall view you know soon out a little bit and saying okay it was already um, uh, too many emails uh, before the pandemic. Uh, don't expect that during the even during the the pandemic, uh, you were going to achieve a, a better result just using the email. You need to evolve and understand better your your customers. Exactly, I fully agree with you, Peter. Next question: How does Leo make use of cross-functional teams on projects involving marketeers, sales, and medical teams, especially medical teams, because it's getting very, very hot topic nowadays, right? You're right. Um, and, and I think that you say working cross functionally is, uh, is another uh, must. Uh, it always makes things a little more complicated uh, when, we, when we have, you say, a big team involved in, in planning projects, uh, planning activities with our customers. Um, but there's no way around it. Uh, we have. Uh, as a requirement for when we do, you say, project briefs for what we call the uh, cross-channel customer journeys, uh, that it is a cross, uh, cross-functional, um, say, planning process, uh, so that we get, you say, the understanding across the function, cross-functional team and also the learnings across the cross-functional team. Because it's there's nothing as good as, you say, setting an objective and then uh, checking how did it go? Uh, what was the reason why we didn't perform as we should? Uh, why did what was the reason why we performed better than expected? Um, so getting these learnings cross functionally, I think, is is important. And also for we all know that, for example, the approval process is really challenging of approval of, of content uh, when it comes to campaign in in pharma. Uh, and therefore, it's very important that medical uh, regulatory and so on also are involved in in the right. Uh, um, you say parts of the project. Not everybody needs to be part of everything, but they need to be part of defining the project. They need to be part of learning from the pro uh, project, and then of course fulfill the uh, different roles in, in the process. Thank you, Peter. Joaquin, anything to add? Maybe, maybe. Sorry again for interrupting, but uh, maybe uh, I said medical regulatory. I think also sales, because of course sales is typically not always a part of our. Uh, you say campaign planning, uh, because they are on the road, uh, and they should be. Um, but it is important if, if they have, you say, an outcome or a role to play in the uh, customer journey, uh, that they're also briefed and, and that we listen to them and then they understand, you say, what's the role, how do we follow up, uh, and also what's the value for me, or how do I react if I if it doesn't create value for me, because then we need to change. Well, really Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you to add here. Uh, well, for for us, this cross-functional team is really a, a challenge. From from our side, from the agency side, you need to consider that uh, for some of these projects, we need to put in place some um, uh, architects in health cloud projects, or integrating uh, with a uh, sidecore uh, websites, or uh, even the the campaign operation is coming from uh, very low levels, probably in summer in Europe, uh, to a peak for launching more than 20, 25 campaigns per month in, in some month during the, the year. So we are trying to support as uh, the best as we can to, to Leo from the cross-functional teams, but uh, from the from the technical side, you know, because you need very different profiles in terms of consultants, architects, developers, specialists, uh, and also uh, working with different third parties 
uh, in some of these campaigns, there are really a lot of companies involved, from creative companies uh, to um, different Leo, uh, pharma uh, uh, specialists or business uh, units together with uh, with us and even other vendors. So we try to uh, orchestrate as uh, the best as we can and provide them support in this uh, all this uh, uh, challenging situation. Thank you, Joaquin. And let's uh, remain with you with another question, which is what are the next steps for pharma companies, which you see as a, a solution and a partner, that are pioneers in digital transformation and omnichannel strategy? Um, well, my, my overall comment here is that um, some companies, companies are trying to go very fast, you know, over this race. I need to, uh, we still need to set some ground and understand it really, which is the benefit and the value for for the different um, uh, affiliates, how we provide value for this uh, uh, marketing and sales team. And having said that, we see a lot of uh, requests or advance in uh, these more advanced projects. Uh, when you we were speaking before about the, this next spec action, how we interact better within the digital channels and the and the sales reps and just really just in the artificial intelligence not in the way it was mentioned some years before uh, just for the sake of using the technology but uh, with more uh, uh, on a results base and based on the experience for for real projects i think that uh, over this year we have a lot of uh, this kind of uh, projects Thank you, Joaquin. Back to you, Peter. We all know we are going in some way of new normal, next normal, whatever you would like to call it. And uh, I would say that field force activities are intensively going back again as uh, in times of pre-COVID. But how can this activity coexist with the evolution of these new digital channels which we implemented during COVID? Absolutely right. Um, it, it is going back to close to normal in some countries and, and uh, still far from normal in, in I think in, in some especially northern European countries um, but but I would say that it, it definitely has to coexist uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, relationship between the rep and the physician um, is a must uh, physicians uh, like human beings they like relationships they like to see people they know uh, and I think it's uh, reps and their you say engagement with the physician is one of the val most valuable uh, parts of the omnichannel strategy. Uh, so we should just use it uh, wisely. Uh, we should use it uh, when it makes most sense for the customers, where it most, makes most sense, uh, and for the message where it makes makes most, uh, makes most sense. So um, I, I see it as a key component uh, going forward for sure. Uh, and and this is exactly what I what I mean when I say let's integrate sales and marketing. Let's use sales when uh, when we should use sales and let's use uh, other channels when, when it's possible or more relevant. Joaquin, okay, anything to add here? Well, for, for me, based on the experience from, from other customers, I see that the non-visited customers, in, in there are different pharma kind of companies, but the non-visited one is, a, um, there's a lot of thought behind which are which will be the best strategy. So as uh, Peter mentioned, in the existing customers, of course, is the best adaptation. But what will happen in the non-visited one? And even for uh, some uh, other customer, we see an, an some kind of innovation uh, in the pharma industry, even launching e-commerce channels. Obviously not for HCPs. I'm speaking more for for uh, pharmas, uh, pharmacists. Uh, channels, but uh, even some companies, uh, we are in some uh, pilot uh, projects launching e-commerce. So it's a big innovation here. And I, I think that there's still some innovation that will come over the years. Thank you, Martin. Back to you, Peter, which is, uh, what is your approach when it comes to data and metrics? Does the new approach differ from the previous one which we had uh, and, uh, before COVID? I think it, it does uh, change, uh, Dario. Um, we, as I think most other companies, also have challenges of integrating uh, data uh, between our different platforms, even though we have uh, integration. Um, it's just difficult to get a fully integrated uh, view of the customer. Um, but I think we can also, until we have that, we can also do a lot with what we have. 
Uh, we are now starting to use a lot of historical data when we plan our activities. Uh, if a customer has never opened an email, why should we continue to send uh, him or her emails? If a customer uh, likes to go to webinars with us, why shouldn't we offer them more webinars? Um, and, and when it comes to reporting, uh, where we until quite recently sort of had a wealth of data, uh, engagement data, uh, we could see uh, how much we did uh, uh, and with whom we did it. Uh, now we are moving towards, you say, scoring uh, the individual physician uh, in, in the engagement with Leo um, on the purchase ladder, brand adoption ladder, uh, and then getting the outcomes from the uh, different activities so that we can score them better and better and know uh, where they are in, in relation to, to Leo and how we can uh, say change their, uh, what's the next step in order to change their behavior towards uh, what way we would like them to be. Thank you, Peter. Hawken, anything to add on that? Uh, not, not, not really here. Uh, I see a lot of maturity over, over the, the years and the, the experience that uh, uh, we have together. I see that uh, some of the points has evolved over the years for more basic to more mature and based on previous years and previous campaigns. Uh, and we see that they are evolving. And as uh, uh, Peter command, commented, also in the terms of metrics, we are more moving from more digital ones, like the open rates, uh, like email metrics, I would say, or digital metrics, to more business oriented, like uh, where is this uh, uh, customer in the adoption ladder, ladder for example, or the, this kind of stuff. Obviously, it's, it's challenging. It's not easy, I would say, but uh, this is the. I think that this is the the direction that uh, Peter wants in in this project. Thank you, Morgan. Speaking about challenges, what is the main challenge which you are facing at Real Leo when rolling out an omnichannel approach to 19 European countries? There's a lot of challenges. Um, we have a, I think we have a really strong uh, infrastructure of, of technology, even though it can still become much stronger. Uh, we have a good support uh, behind what we do, um, but we also have uh, significant challenges, especially when it comes to, again, I, I mentioned earlier, the approval processes of content. Uh, we need to find better ways of, uh, say, for LMR, MLR uh, approval of, of content. Uh, it still, still takes us too long. Um, content development in general, uh, we are right now uh, working on uh, you say modular content, uh, personalized content, um, and that transformation also with our global brand teams is something which is uh, going on. Uh, I'm, I'm quite convinced that we're getting there. There's a lot of interest from our global brand teams. Um, and of course, skills in general. Uh, I think we all we all need to, to le uh, learn much more about Omnichannel, get experiences, um, but it will come. Uh, if we have patience, um, and urgency, uh, then we will get it. Uh, so uh, we are we are we are on the right um, trajectory, um, but but there's still a lot for us to do. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Oh, no, nothing to up here, uh, Daria. Well, fantastic. And last question, which we prepared for you both panelists, is uh, what has been your most important takeaway from this digital journey and uh, transformation process, which we are still undertaking? Peter? Um, I think a big learning for me has been uh, say learning that uh, technology, I've always said that uh, customer is king, uh, focus on the customer, uh, focus on the patient and pharma, focus on the ACP. Um, but, but I really think that uh, we need to understand uh, technology and data better than we have done in the past, especially in, uh, in sales and marketing. Uh, letting somebody else uh, take care of the R&D part. Uh, yeah. But technology and data to be used in, in sales and marketing has been a, a big learning for, for me that, that we need to take that really, really serious uh, right from the planning of the activities. What can we do? Uh, what do we have data to support to do? What can our systems uh, help us do? Um, and, and then I would say another really important uh, learning is that this thing about not looking at omnichannel as this huge elephant uh, because 
it scares us. Uh, it, it's too difficult. <laughs> you, you sort of lose your uh, motivation and, and you, uh, you fail too much. But take it down to tangible projects, tangible projects where which are not too complicated, where you get people on board uh, who learn from it, uh, who start to see that uh, we were able to do some of the things which are key of, of omnichannel. Um, I think this is this is a really important uh, learning for me. Thank you, Peter. Joaquin, yours? Wow, I think that for me is coming from a more technology um, view of. Uh, uh, this problem is all the different the difficulty for launching a digital campaign here is uh, absolutely different what you see in other sectors you know the complexity for uh, given having these um, uh, approvals from everywhere uh, all the different uh, or business unit for the analytics part uh, for uh, the the comics uh, or uh, commercial excellence uh, teams uh, from the sales reps uh, from the brand teams uh, from external uh, agencies for content providers all this complexity that is behind is really uh, has been a learning for us uh, and understanding how to use better this uh, technology yeah. so I think that uh, um, for us has been also we have been maturing a lot as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, our thinking as a company, uh, helping Leo in, in, in this kind of project. I would say that for other sectors, more evolved multi-channel projects are much more easy. So here is really a challenge, uh, to be honest here. Mm -hmm. my, my, my comment here, Dario. Okay, thank you, Joaquin. We also received a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, one which I would like to pick is, how do you combine field force and digital? Or maybe how do you embed the field force and typical sales rep into the whole digital strategy. Maybe, uh, Peter, you can uh, give a very good insight about that. Um, I think we're all talking quite a lot about uh, the hybrid rep, uh, wanting our reps to be face-to-face -face as well as digital. And I think that is that is a transformation that we should continue to support uh, for our reps to uh, be, become better and better at using digital channels. Um, it'll take like long time for some. It will take less time for for others. Uh, so that's one element. Um, the other element is uh, when we, for example, do uh, cross-channel customer journeys at the moment. We always make sure uh, we use, you can say, Viva um, platform for for rep activities, and we use Salesforce for the marketing activities. But we always make sure that when we do an activity uh that for, for example that there'll be a, a viva action uh, for the rep uh, so if we send an email and the physician wants to hear more they can request a call um and by doing that uh you say the rep becomes part of the uh, omnichannel uh, journey um and i think this is this is a very simple way to do it in fact uh it takes a bit of integration but it's a simple way and it's something where suddenly the rep understands that it's not necessarily doing everything differently it's simply about you say, playing their role in the engagement with the customer alongside uh, the other activities that we do. Um, hope that answered the question. Otherwise, I'm happy to try to go deeper. Thank you, Peter. I am satisfied, so I believe the audience is satisfied as well. <laughs> Thank you. you. Um, well, for me, I think with uh, the evolution and the maturity of this project, I think that the this sector, the pharma companies, will find the exact position for the reps. My uh, just a, a quick experience. I'm, I'm a lover for for a brand. The name is uh, Peloton. They are a bike kind of bike, you know, that you you bike at home, and they are a very digital company. Uh, absolutely digital. The kind of uh, multi-channel experience is, is amazing, you know. Uh, so I find myself buying a, a Peloton. And just on the important moment, I have a sales rep. A sales rep. So uh, even my my point here is that even the most advanced digital companies at the most important moment or when it's efficient, uh, they are using sales reps. So this is a, a something important to consider because I see that they in in more, many uh, projects the uh, this uh, multi-channel as is seen as a way of uh, evolving from the existing one 
uh, or living apart, you know, or living behind the the search reps. Probably with the maturity of the project, my 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 view is that will come a moment that uh, we will see or we will decide which is the the best position for the reps, uh, providing value, you know, for the HCPs. And uh, well, this is my guess. Thank you very much. So we came to an end of this very interesting discussion. Uh, Peter Joaquin was really a great pleasure. We will publish this webinar on our official YouTube channel. So everyone who missed it will have a chance to watch it again, uh, a couple of times, I suppose. And uh, once again, thank you so much and uh, looking for the next one. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much, Tari. Great opportunity. Thanks. Bye-bye.